This episode is sponsored by Kindred Bravely. Kindred Bravely came to life in 2015 by Deanne Akerson, a mom of two, when she couldn't find any comfortable and functional pajamas while nursing her second son. So she decided to design her own line. As moms, we have to stick together, which is where Kindred comes from. And Bravely, well, we all know being a mom can be tough. It is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage and bravery to be a mom. And at Kindred Bravely, they are devoted to making life easier for pregnant and nursing moms, from breast pads and non-skid socks to nursing bras and pajamas. And I might not be pregnant or nursing, but I can advocate completely for how comfortable their clothing is. I wear the uh, cardigan almost every single day, certainly around the house. And I gifted my sister some leggings. Um, She is pregnant with her third child, and she is absolutely over the moon for them. She wants me to get her some more. So you can get your own and save while you do by using my code UNSTRESS20 to save 20% off your purchase at kindredbravely.com. You are listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am so glad that you're here. And this week, I'm speaking with Washington Post columnist and author Tamar Haspel, and we're discussing her hilarious and equally inspiring new book, To Boldly Grow, which details how she and her husband relocated from bustling city life in New York City to two acres on Cape Cod, and they committed to growing, gathering, and hunting firsthand food every single day. First-hand food, meaning they got it themselves. So you're going to learn how she went from cluelessness to competence and why diving into learning something new is the key to more adventure and fun for the entire family. So at the very least, this is going to inspire you to start growing something in your in your backyard or even in your home. Um, and also to go out and get this book, because when I say it's funny, it's really funny and you learn so much. So I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. If you like it, of course, please leave us a review, share it on your stories and uh, tag us at motherhood on stress. Cause I love to see where these episodes go into the world and please enjoy this episode with Tamar Haspel. Hello, Tamar. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here. And I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I always have to start uh, with the origin story of my guests because I find that that always gives a really good foundation until into the work that you're doing. Um, so, take us back. How did your home life nurture and establish this sense of curiosity that led you to having a career as a writer? Wow, I don't get asked too too often to go back that far. And, you know, it, at this point, it feels like the Pleistocene era. But I grew up <laughs> in a house with parents who were curious and talked about everything. Our dinner table conversations were about, you know, what was happening in the world and what everybody was reading. And, and I just got the sense that there's lots of interesting stuff out in the world and it's there for the taking. Um, and it's, I guess that has colored my approach to these things for my entire life. Although I have to admit, I don't think about that very much. So I'm kind of glad you asked. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I find with, with all the interviews that I've done over the years, it's always, it's always that those conversations around the dinner table that people remember having, it really does stay with them. And I think, you know, this is a podcast basically for, for parents and mothers specifically. And so to have that really just hitting that home and, and hearing you say that and how it led to really, you know, everything that you have done in life and everything that, you know, you find to be important. I think that that's a really Mm -hmm. crucial thing to mention. And so I'm so glad that you did. And then it leads us into why we're here today to talk about your beautiful, hilarious book to boldly grow, finding joy, adventure, and dinner in your own backyard. Talk to us about that, the iteration of the book. And, and did you know when you, when you were first starting out that this would actually be a book? I had no idea. And this whole project started before I even envisioned it as a project when my husband and I lived in New York City. And we had an apartment on the Upper West Side. And I had 
a long history of expressing my interest in the world through reading and talking to people. Um, I was a writer and I did a lot of things from my armchair. Um, but Kevin was a doer and he wanted to have a garden on our roof and we got permission to be able to do it. And we put a bunch of whiskey barrels up there and it was actually pretty hard work. You have to haul the stuff all the way up. And there was a ladder up to the, to the part of the roof that we were using and the big heavy bags. And, and it was interesting. And then we actually grew these little sweet cherry tomatoes. Have you ever grown those little tomatoes? Not personally, you know the ones but I'm talking about? yeah, of course, of course. It was so you should try it because when you grow something and then it finally ripens and you stand out in the sun and you eat it still warm and it has that tomato vine smell, it is like the best tomato that the world has ever seen. And so we did that and it, it sparked my interest in, okay, what is it about food that you're invested in, food that you grow yourself? So then you know, circumstances mostly moved us to Cape Cod in 2008. And so we moved from an Upper West Side little apartment to, you know, two acres with a little house on a lake on Cape Cod with lots of trees. Um, and we started looking around and saying, okay, well, what can I do food wise? I write about food here on Cape Cod that we couldn't do in Manhattan. The answer was all kinds of things. So I said to Kevin, do you think we can? eat one food a day that we, you know, get firsthand, that we, we grow or gather, hunt or fish. And we were off to the races. And, but no, I, you know, I thought it was going to be an interesting project, something I could write about. Um, it, you know, it was more than a lark, but not all that much more. And it just, it, it took on a life of its own and it ended up being way more compelling than I ever thought it would be. Yeah, let's talk about that because when you're starting out, I mean, obviously you, you start out small, you're you're on the rooftop, and then you make this big jump to Cape Cod. When did you realize that, okay, this is something that we could actually really do together? Or was it, uh, I love how you write in the book, your husband wasn't so on board, not on board, but he didn't know if you could really do it having one thing each and every day, which was so funny. I love I love the way you wrote about that in the book. So can you talk about the moment where you were like, okay, this is actually really possible for us? So I, I like it. it I had this idea and it was, I think it was literally like New Year's Day, 2009. And, and that's when I said to Kevin, do you think we can do this? And so just a little background on Kevin. Yes, he is absolutely a doer and he has a can do attitude. He is also wildly supportive of me and my career and the things I do. And so when I broached this to him and do you think we can do it? And he says, not a chance. I'm like, wait, 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 who are you? And what have you done with Kevin? And I had to bring him around because that first winter where we hadn't prepared for this, we were just sort of springing it on ourselves. And, you know, we had a few things from the garden put by and, you know, there's always clamming on Cape Cod and we live on a pond that has trout in it. So there was trout, but there was no gardening in January, February, or March, and there's no saltwater fish and there are all kinds of things you can't get. So we still, to this day, refer to that as our winter of shellfish because there were an <laughs> awful lot of clams eaten in our house that winter. <gasps> God, that's so cool. Did anything surprise you when you're on this journey? You know, say you're six months in and you're like, am I changing? Like what, what really surprised you in, in this journey? So many things surprised me and, and they kind of fall into two categories. There were things that surprised me about food, but then there were things that surprised me about me. Yeah. And and I think that's why it became compelling to me because, okay, yeah, I learned so many things about what I can grow, what I can't grow. I learned that you can have zero experience and build a class A chicken coop. Mm -hmm. I learned that so many of these things that, that, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, just everybody did. Everybody had backyard chickens. Everybody kept, you know, a, a, a pig in a pen. Um, everybody had a garden and grew a serious amount of vegetables. And 
we've sort of lost track of that. And then it surprises you that it's really not that hard, that you can mm. do it. But then the thing that really got me was that, and this is what took me by surprise, was that it 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 changed me by getting me out of my armchair and by 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 trying thing after thing after thing that I had never done before, I ended up spending all of this time on the steep part of the learning curve. Because let's face it, okay, you can work all your life at skills. I work really hard at being a writer. But the increment from when you've never done it before to when you do it for the very first time is where you learn the most. And the way to stay on that steep part is to keep trying new things. I'm telling you, it's the secret to successful self-improvement is just try things you've never done before. I love that. Did you ever get to a point where you're like, okay, I've mastered this and you still enjoy it? Or do you enjoy more that steep learning curve? Because I feel like for most people, they don't enjoy it. It's uncomfortable. It's not really? fun. Like they feel like they're not smart. I don't know. I mean, I think that's probably what keeps people from trying new things. It's like, oh, I'm just, I'm not good at that. And then that's the decision. And I totally get that because like I am somebody who I, there, there are a few things that I'm good at and I'm super comfortable doing them for, for a living. I, I do words, I write and I talk and I'm comfortable doing those things and I'm comfortable going out in public and talking to total strangers like you about you know, whatever it happens to be. But there are other things like the like if if the here's the circle of human accomplishment, the my little slice is like this tiny sliver, and everything else is uncomfortable. But if you venture mm. out into it, you realize that if you mess up, nobody's gonna die on the table. Nothing bad happens. Um, you just try it a different way the next time. And and so I think. I might be a little more reluctant to be on the steep part of the learning curve if either the stakes were higher or the job mm. was harder. <laughs> but since <laughs> a lot of these things are pretty straightforward and the stakes are pretty low, it's just it's it just is plain old interesting. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I feel like so many people crave an interesting life or just to have a little spark back in the norm, especially after, you know, the past two years, where's a good place to start to kind of ease into that? Is it, is it a raised bed? Is it a, is it a tomato plant? Where can the listener begin to ease into that? If this is something that's completely foreign to them? It's such a great question. And so when I started this, there was like no name for the all of the foods that you can get yourself, whether you grow them or whether it's livestock or a mushroom hunt or fishing, whatever it is. So my husband and I started calling it firsthand food. And it's anything that you get with your own two hands. And the great thing about it is that it's such a broad category that there's something that can meet you where you are. So depending on where you are is, okay, where do you want to start? If you're in a city, and you don't have a lot of outdoor space. Well, maybe you can, like me, put a tomato plant on the roof, or if you have a patio, you can put it there. Maybe you can get one of those like, mushroom kits that actually sprouts when you water it. Those are actually really cool. They're kind of like like an adult chia pet. <laughs> and there's also, you, you know those hydroponic uh, herb gardens on the windowsill? Yeah. You can do that. Or you can go out on, uh, if you can venture out of the city, try a, a, a mushroom walk, different groups lead them and you, and you can go. If you have kids, which I'm sure most of your listeners do, kids can really get into this stuff. And there's actually a little bit of evidence that if kids do these things, if they get dirty in service of dinner, that they're just like little adults. They get invested in it, and then that food becomes more interesting to them. And kids, for example, who garden are often more likely to try vegetables. So kids are fascinated by 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 seeds and by chickens and by mushrooms, sort of in the same way that adults are. And But one of the things you said I want to go back to, because I think it's really important, it's this idea of looking for something new. And, you know, when Kevin and I moved here, I was in my mid forties and everything 
was new. And if I had stayed in New York, I don't think I would have tried much of anything, maybe the garden on the roof, but I don't know that I would have gone that much farther. But because I ended up doing more of this, I became like the world's biggest advocate for doing something completely different in middle age. It 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 kind of almost gives you a new lease on life. It, it's like a whole new chapter. And it's it's rejuvenating and energizing. Oh, I love that. That just gave me chills because I feel like so many people don't have that thought. And then what what is missed out of their life because of that, because of not taking that next step or taking that leap. And I know for a fact someone is going to hear your words and and make a change. So that's really exciting to me when that happens like in real well, time. If somebody does, I hope they'll reach out. I'm very easy to find and let me know because one of the most gratifying things is hearing from people who have read my book or read my work and they find it helpful or useful or even maybe on a good day inspiring and that's as a writer as a journalist it's the absolute best thing I can hope for right it's that full circle moment because you put your work out into the world and then you don't know what's going to happen with it and then to hear back I'm sure it's just like ah you know like you get it I, I love that And that must happen to you too. You must hear from listeners who say, I heard this on your podcast and as a result, something good happened. You must get those emails and calls and things. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, that's, that makes everything worth it. It makes, you know, the, the moments where you don't know what to do or something's difficult. I mean, that makes it worth every single second that you're just like, oh, okay, I have to sit down. (laughs) Um, You and me both. (laughs) Right, right. You have to sit down at the computer or the blank page. Uh, So talk to us about, I love how you wrote about how when you did go to the store, you know, the traditional grocery store, things looked different to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? How, how has packaged food, processed food changed in your eyes since taking on, you know, this life-changing journey? It's a great question. And so I think that, that in so many ways, our modern food system has been good for us. It allows people to not have to grow their own food. So you and I are free to write books, to host podcasts and do all of these other things we do. Um, but it, it has come with consequences. And I think for a lot of us, our very basic sense of what food is has shifted away from plants and animals and sort of toward boxes and bags, the ones with the bright colors and the exciting punctuation that occupy those middle aisles in the grocery store. And, you know, people keep telling us, you know, the health authorities, eat real food, eat real food. But it's hard to do because the boxes and the bags are staring you in the face 24-7. And let's face it, you cannot leave me alone with a bag of Doritos. (laughs) And there are, these are foods that are deliberately engineered to appeal to you in that way. And, and I think that when you actually spend time with plants and animals, the real food, these are the foods that humans have thrived on for our entire history, that sense of what food is shifts back. And, and spending that time, having that visceral experience is sort of an antidote to this overload of these super tempting foods that are in our face 24 seven. And I think like I go to the grocery store and like I said, like Doritos taste just as good as they always did, but I don't really think of them as food. They're kind of in a separate category. It's not something I feed to my family. Um, and I think, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who have, you know, gardeners, hunters, fishermen, you know, and I asked them the same question, is that food that you harvest yourself, is it, is it different from other food? And every single person, literally every single one says, yes, the tomato you grow is different from the tomato in the grocery store. And it has a power that the grocery store tomato doesn't have because it hits you where you live. Like the, the imperative to feed ourselves and our families is primordial. And, and this food scratches that itch And that's why I think it can sort of reset our sense of food. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yeah, I mean, I think 
even just the nurturing aspect of it, like you're invested emotionally, mentally, physically into this plant and right. then it gives back to you what you've given to it. I mean, again, going back to a full circle moment, I think that that's so essential to who we are as humans. And and the fact that we've moved away from that, I think I think now is a really great time to to move closer to that, that traditional way of living. And as the pandemic has sort of pushed people out of cities and people have been hunkered down, this is a really sort of positive and constructive thing you can do. Um, and, and yeah, so I think it's a good COVID fit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it goes back to so many people who did, you know, during the pandemic, start new hobbies and, and tried new things just because, you know, whether they were bored or whether they were just like itching for something to do, I think, you know, we, we do have options when life gets really hard and we feel like we don't have a lot of control. Like this is something that you could, you could do and you could create. And it's a positive silver lining out of a a dismal situation. What you just said is really important because in the modern world, so much of our lives are outside of our control. And if you have a problem with your job, with your finances, with your car, with your marriage, with your dishwasher, you need other people or other things to cooperate to fix those problems. But if you're unhappy with the way that you eat or the way that you're spending your time, um, that's a problem you can solve single-handedly. And Thinking about, okay, I'm going to spend some time trying to figure out where food comes from and how I can make food appear in my house is sort of a constructive and small place to start on taking control of a problem that makes a lot of people unhappy. And I think, so did you read the book the life-changing magic of tidying up. No, no, I know about it, of course. Do you remember when that book came yeah. up? Okay, so I got the book because I wanted to see what all the fuss was at. I have lots of problems, but I don't have a stuff problem. So it wasn't like it was written for me, but I wanted to see why it was so compelling to so many people. So Marie Kondo does this whole thing. She tells you how to, how to clean up your house, how to throw things away, only keep things that spark joy, roll up your socks. Um, And then at the end of the book, she's got a section where she talks about how her clients do this. They clean up their whole house and then they go on to do things like ask for the promotion or get the long overdue divorce or lose the 15 pounds or whatever it is. And at first I said to myself, oh yeah, right. Why? Because their house is clean, but that's not why. The reason is that they took control over a problem that was theirs to control and they solved it and solving a problem builds strength and confidence and strength and confidence beget strength and confidence and so for me firsthand food was a way to continue to solve problems starting really small how do i build a raised bed How do I design a chicken coop? How do I care for chickens? How do I, you know, have livestock? And those problems got bigger and bigger. And each one built the confidence and the strength to tackle the next one. And and it was the trajectory that felt so good and so strengthening. Mm, I love it. Yeah, it is all about the journey, isn't it? It's not about okay. I've, I've about produced, <laughs> yeah, I've produced this food, or I've produced this this clam pasta. It's about going out there with the rake and getting it and digging the clams up. That is exactly right. And the uh, the clam pasta is damn good. I have to say, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the journey is 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 what ended up being compelling to me. Something that I thought was so interesting that you wrote about was how, you know, people think that, oh, you know, you're just going out there for for self-reliance, self-sufficiency. You know, you can take care of, you and your husband can take care of each other and that's all you need. But you actually said that you were more interdependent than ever. Can you talk about that? It was funny because when I first started this project and I started writing about it, I had a blog 
And people assumed that I was in it for ideological reasons. Either, you know, it could be uh, crunchy granola opt out of the industrialized food system, or it could be, you know, build a bulwark against Armageddon. But a lot of people who grow a lot of their own food are doing it for that reason, for self-sufficiency. But Kevin and I, we're big fans of interdependence. We think that that's what greases the skids of civilization. And what was what was interesting about one of the things that was interesting about this project is that far from walling us off and and having us be you know sufficient unto ourselves, it connected us to our community. And I think a lot of small communities and even some very large communities have um, you know uh, gardening clubs, the Mushroom Society. We joined a fishing club here. And we met people in our community, not only who we wouldn't have met before, but who were instrumental in helping us negotiate all of these new things that we were trying. And it became a whole facet of our life, not just because of the activities, but also because of the people. And I think, you know, we're we're all spending so much time in front of screens and to get out to be working in the woods or on a lake or in your garden and to be connecting with other people helps recapture some of those things about society that maybe we're letting slip that, you know, we're all immersed on our phones. Yeah. Yeah. And to bring your kids along with you and have them with adults and with other kids doing these new things. I think that that is just it's so transformative, not only to the adult, but to the child who sees that this is a way of being, this is a way of living, and it is setting the stage for a brighter future. And it's just its just a natural part of life that we've sort of lost. And some of my favorite times, I mean, our kids were up here over the winter, and, you know, they're grown now, and but the whole clan of us went clamming and you know we didn't have quite enough waiters for everybody we had to share the rakes but it was a beautiful january day and there were all kinds of families out there with little kids big kids dogs and it was a place where people in our community go to participate in this really wholesome activity and it it it, it warms my heart i know it's corny but it warms my heart no, no. And that's something that those kids and even your grown adult kids will always remember. You know, you'll always have that memory of going up there and being with you and having that day. I just love that. It was a great day. I will tell you, it was a great day. Oh, I love it. Okay. So what is next for you? What What is the next project? Are you working on something now? You're learning something now? So um, my day job as a columnist for the Washington Post, I write about some of the the geeky parts of uh, of food, agriculture, and nutrition. And I think a lot of people are interested in not just improving their diets for them, but include but improving their diets for the planet. And so uh, I'm launching a podcast with another journalist, Mike Grunewald, and hopefully we're going to help people sort through all the conflicting information about how foods affect our environment and our climate and how we can change those things for the better. So that's going to be launching in June. We're recording the first sessions now. So I think that's super exciting and it's something that, that I think people care about increasingly. Oh, 100%. And what's the name of the podcast so we can all tune in? The name of the podcast is Climavores, and you can get it wherever podcasts are are listed, and uh, Apple, Spotify. And, uh, and we hope to keep it entertaining and not super wonky <laughs> and uh, actionable. So, uh, so you can really walk away, hopefully, understanding these things a little better. Love it. Love it. And do you have any final lasting thoughts you would like to leave with the listener today uh, from your life experience, from the book itself, something that you really want the listener to walk away with? Yeah. Give it a shot. Take a flyer. There's so many things that we have sort of been schooled to believe are the province of experts. And I write about food and there's a whole bunch of things like that. You know, nutrition is one of them. Dieting is one of them. But there are so many things out there that 
lots of people did before we had experts or a way for them to disseminate their opinions. There are so many things that are doable, and yet we have sort of learned to be helpless. So find the things that interest you and don't be afraid. Jump in without a net. Nothing bad's going to happen. And the upside is tremendous. Mm, Tamara, um, I'm sure the book is available everywhere, but where can people find out more about you online and get the book? So you can find out more about me at my website, tamarhaspel.com, and that'll give you links to be able to buy the book at the place of your choice. Um, It'll tell you a little bit more about my work and give you a starting point if you want to read more of that. You can also always find me on Twitter, at, at Tamar Haspel. I do a lot of uh, ranting and dissecting and bemoaning, but also <laughs> celebrating on Twitter. And uh, and if you want to see some pictures of all of our projects, you can find me at Tamar Haspel Insta on Instagram. Oh, love it. Okay. All of that, of course, guys, will be in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today for the inspiration, for the motivation, for the courage, the raw courage. Uh, I feel it within me. And I know that this, you know, once this goes off around the world, other people are listening and tuning in and getting that same thing from you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, you're a delight to talk to. Thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast.